All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I know more people will be joining us uh, here shortly, um, but thank you for joining us today for the Oxygen Forensics and Cloud9 device collection through production. Uh, our big plan today is to cover a lot of ground from end to end on the EDRM. Don't worry, I did not put that in the slide deck, uh, but uh, so we'll be covering from collections through production uh, on, a, on a sort of a big scale, uh, diving deep here and there. Uh, we are looking at putting this together as a series, so you will be able to see uh, some deeper dives into collections and into review workflows. And also, uh, one thing that we're finding um, is that a lot of firms are navigating toward doing in-house collections or collections on their own um, because the technology is catching up and it's a lot easier to uh, to build out those departments without um, huge expenses. So that that to come today, we're just again going to dive deep in or er, you know, sort of broad across the, the spectrum there. Uh, but first, certainly want to give introductions. I'm Rick Clark. I'm the VP of uh, Marketing and Strategic Partnerships. So I'm really grateful and glad to be working with Oxygen Forensics. It was a uh, really just, as you'll see today, a perfect uh, unity of uh, technology so we can cover, you know, wider spreads of, uh, of the EDRM uh, together. So uh, but uh, so I've been in the industry for over 20 years. I'm at Cloud9 by way of acquisition. I started the company ESI Analyst. Uh, that was meant to uh, present all of the data you're seeing today in native formats. Um, so you can do a lot of link analysis across. This has now been rolled into Cloud9 Review three years later. I'm actually coming up on my three year anniversary uh, here at Cloud9. But again, been in the industry for for quite a while. So um, but. Keith, would love to hear from you. And uh, so an introduction, background, and um, yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Thanks for letting me uh, play along today, Rick. So my name is Keith Lockhart from Oxygen, and I've also been in our industry 20 years-ish, which puts more mortality right in my face. But I have a uh, originally a law enforcement background that turned into a technologist type thing, uh, but fell into an education path where I spent a long time uh, taking technology and making people so that sometimes didn't have a care in the world about it, learn how to use it, um, ideally to make their day better, uh, which kind of dovetails into the mission statement of oxygen. When we say we want to make the world a safer place, I get to go to bed and wake up sometimes in a better mood because of that is our mission statement. But uh, it's a long investigative mindset background with technology. And today, um, my job at oxygen is the VP of technology and training which keeps my training roots, but lets me be super fortunate to share our technology love amongst all of our forward-facing customer groups, like our solution architects, the training teams, the support teams, and our quality assurance folks that, you know, really kind of puts our company in a, a customer success orientation all the time. So when everybody's be successful and have good, good times with their technology. So that's me and what I do. Right. And then, uh... My name is Brian Killing. I'm with Cloud9. I'm our VP of products here at Cloud9. Uh, I've been uh, with Cloud9 for about 11 years, so I've seen uh, you know the changes across the industry and across our products, and you know excited about our partnership here with Oxygen as it expands our ability to work with you know other collected data sources, uh, you know, and, and work directly with a, a fantastic team there with Keith and everybody else involved. Uh, you know, from a day-to-day -day role, um, I work with our, you know, you know, development team and kind of design, you know, future development and, you know, increase uh, functionality with inside the products. Uh, but I also work with clients and customers all the time, you know, whether that's helping them devise uh, processes around, you know, whether it's collection, review, or production protocols, uh, or going out there and simply looking at improvements that, you know, to workflows where we can actually take those improvements and productize those to make their lives uh, an easier process. So excited to showcase what we've done here with the Oxygen team and, uh, you know, kind of get into the collection to uh, production workflows. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Keith, as well. So I am uh, going to do dual roles. I'll be the moderator as well as uh, kicking off some of our discussion today. Um, I, having that been doing or spe specifically focused on modern data for the past six years now, um, I've, I've seen a lot of trends and growth in our legal industry and how folks are incorporating this into discovery uh, through obviously uh, being required to do so. But what is driving the challenges overall? Uh, what we're seeing is that, and this is the, the latest Internet Minute 2023, so I think the folks uh, at eDiscovery Today and LitMG haven't updated just yet, but that is okay. Uh, this still, you know, shows a, a pretty significant growth 
uh, transition from email to short message communications, whether that's Teams, Slack, text messages. Uh, so some of the call outs here uh, that, that really impact the discovery side of things is that uh, we're, we see over a million organizations are using Teams and 91% of the Fortune 100 uh, are using Teams as well. So it is uh, a significant migration from internal chatter uh, over email to leveraging uh, Teams. Slack is um, is uh, is also uh, growing, you know, pretty well with 17 billion, right? So what we're looking at is uh, that text messages, Slack, Teams. Those are the biggest culprits we see from the communication standpoint of uh, of, of evidence uh, working its way into discovery. And what well, we did our own poll as well uh, back in July. And what we found is, is a pretty interesting number. 84% um, are always or frequently having issues dealing with text or chat app data for discovery. That's having issues with dealing with it, right? So we're, we're, we're finding that partnerships like with Oxygen Forensics from the collections and then creating uh, streamlined workflows for review that you'll see today um, are helping those case teams manage this data a lot better. Now, Besides text, so we see text messages quite a bit, is there's uh, with Teams, we're finding half uh, and then Slack at 35%. So, um, and it's interesting, I speak at a lot of conferences. I was in uh, New York for the master's conference last month and just to the, you know, hey, raise your hands if you're having challenges with, with Slack or Teams. Most of the room raised their hand. The year before asked the same question and it was about half. So we are seeing the, the, the trending uh, forward, whether they're you know official you know channels to 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 get that data or just you know again polls here, but uh, that is what we're seeing. Rick, and so yeah, go ahead. Uh, just since we're here, and you know, I I had this question before, but I thought I would save it to now. Um, and you just mentioned it. What are some of the big issues when you say raise your hand if you're having those issues? Give me a couple examples of the issues they're having with. Discovery on the whole, or uh, texting or chat app data, or Teams and Slack. Just when, when they raise their hand, what are the problems? Yeah, thank you, Keith. Uh, the, the challenges that we see generally is um, one: the industry has always focused on creating everything into a document. Hmm. So what that means is, if you have a bunch of Slack or Teams data that has to get converted to a PDF, or for like, for instance, relativity, uh, relativity short message format, that is a document and then that impacts the review. So let's say the three of us, or let's say Keith, you and I are on a conversation over Teams. And then we add Brian because we need his help for more Cloud9 review stuff. Well, in the review platforms, it will end. Uh, it'll say, hey, let's bring in Brian. And then they have to go run a search to find where the three of us pick up. Uh, one of the things that you'll see for us, uh, we keep that sort of context together. And so you can see the conversation uh, going forward. Converting everything to document as well is very expensive. It costs money to, to, to convert all of these exports into those documents as well. So we're, we're skipping that step, which you'll see here in a little bit. But those are some of the, the challenges. And then the review aspect of it, you know, we had a case where it was a Slack case and they said, hey, Rick, we've got 18 gigs of JSON. Can you just throw that into your platform and we can do the review? And we said, sure, we like, <laughs> we like money. And that's a pretty big one we found there was, 80 million messages. And so they had initially scoped out 40 attorneys to review all of this data for over three months because we did an exercise of, well, we see the cat meme channel, we see some of the things in here. Why don't we pull this down first? Select the channels and the people, directs, multi-directs, and we'll pull all that data in. Went from 80 million to less than a million, 40 attorneys to three, and it was done in three weeks. So there's just efficiencies and, and things that we're doing. But if without that, that's just status quo. You have all those volumes. You have to sort of ram that through. So long answer, but it was a very good, good. Yeah, it's good to hear. Through. Good to understand a lot of that. Okay. Yeah. So what we're finding uh, on top of that are more of these common data requests, right? So the second bullet you see, email and e-files. Well, we're we're seeing, as mentioned earlier, corporate messaging chat applications as part of that, but we're seeing the text messages the calls, voicemails, uh, voice memos, linked content, right? So we can have a whole <laughs> you know, day of just talking about how to manage linked uh, files uh, in emails and, and Teams, right? So if I want to send Brian an Excel spreadsheet, I'm just now doing a hyperlink versus sending the whole attachment 
Uh, there are considerations there. Uh, geolocation, very important. Uh, where someone was, uh, when they may have sent a text message or took a picture, uh, that data is, is, is can be recorded. And then there's uh, user activity. So these are your forensic artifacts, like plugging in thumb drives, um, websites visited, things downloaded. That's all preserved on laptops and devices. That also can be explored. And we're finding that to coming into employment matters, uh, white collar, uh, and then social media, the whole breadth, right? So the posts, the comments, the replies, uh, those are becoming, you know, um, piece of evidence. Well, visitor logs. So, um, you know, that. So if that's important to see who was visiting a location and they clocked in, clocked out with a, with a key card, uh, legacy systems, structured data of all kind, right? Structured data for me could be things like um, you're doing a support ticket on at Delta to fix your ticket and you're talking to a live person, that sort of, you know, that structured data can come out and get rendered into to, uh, conversations as well. But but Keith, curious from, from your perspective, when you're seeing uh, data and you're working with your clients and training, what are you seeing? Uh, as far as these types of requests? Well, so it's not so much these types of requests, it's the sources from which they come. <laughs> I mean, that, and you know, you, we talked about this a little bit, Rick, and, and layering different things, different sources together for all of these different data requests. Um, that's, we, as you're going through them, I'm thinking, wow, where can you get those? Where can you get those? From what do you get those? How do those get into uh, consideration? That's a great list. And it's not uncommon at all. The the magic behind it is, well, where did you get your geolocation data? Where did you pull that user activity, that USB connection to that machine? Where did you get your social media? Did somebody download their own Facebook account or Google? I mean, there's a I think gigs and gigs and gigs of data right there. What apps are supported today when you say a corporate messaging or chat application, or is it a proprietary one that somebody built for their own use? And how do you deal with that? I mean, that's the it's, to me, it's all about the sourcing of this information. I'm probably a little spoiled and privileged that the way we parse this stuff, I just, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, great. I'm just concerned of where I'm getting it. And am I getting all of it? Can I get more of it? <laughs> you know, the more I can take, if I can encapsulate you, Rick, and find all these things about you and leverage that into my investigation or my case or my matter, that's better for all of us at that point. So yeah, great list. Uh, how are we going to get it? Where are we going to get it? But I think that's kind of where our partnership is coming into play in that regard. So Super. I'll yeah. And we'll dig into that on the next slide and further um, on, on the house. But but yeah, we're finding this to be more of a challenge. And 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 ultimately, counsel opposing counsel is not able to argue this away. Right. So the request comes in. You're not able to argue away this data as 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 you were a while back. In fact, in January 2024, so this year, um, the U.S. Justice Department's antitrust division uh, Manish Kumar said that these updates to our legal process will ensure that neither opposing counsel nor their clients can feign ignorance when their clients or companies choose to conduct business through ephemeral messages. The Antitrust Division and the Federal Trade Commission expect that opposing counsel will preserve and produce any and all responsive documents, including data from ephemeral messaging applications designed to hide evidence. Failure to produce such documents may result in obstruction of justice charges. That's the extreme side, by the way. <laughs> Ephemeral messaging apps are not Slack and Teams. Those are the, the signal and, and the others that, that sort of fall off, right? Snapchat. The, so that's so let's work backwards. So Slack and Teams and, and text messages are going to be pretty commonplace if they not are not already in your particular practice. But yeah, so important to note that um, the, the folks requesting this data are are pretty serious about it. But let's let's dig into uh, to collections, right? So when we have uh, devices or a tablet, for instance, first, uh, we've had oftentimes privacy concerns come up and say, look, I know I did business on my personal phone, uh, whether it was a BYOD or you had your company issued device, but they also use their phone for, for work things. We've seen the cases where they collect both. Um, but we have privacy considerations. So are we going to do a targeted collection on that? So we're leaving out the family, we're leaving out, we're only focused on the conversations between coworkers that would have happened on that device. That can that can happen. But we've had cases where it was a C-suite executive who deleted <clears throat> everything off their device. Um, judge got pretty upset about that and said, well, who'd you talk to about such and such a thing? Well, we had to collect over 100 devices from family, friends, 
coworkers, the like, and then restructure those threads if it came from that person's phone. So be ready as you're working with, with your clients uh, or you are a corporation, um, be ready to have processes in place to, to get at that data. Now, you can do targeted or you can collect the whole thing. I think I come from, I know that I come from the school of thought of collect everything, but push to review only the data that is relevant. Because if for some reason it was Keith and I talking, but then Brian was referenced in one of those and we have to go back to the well and get Brian's you know, text messages, it can be difficult to go collect from that custodian yet again. Um, workstations, laptops, we all know that very well, uh, but we are finding that cloud and social media accounts are important. Uh, Keith will be doing the deep dive into this, so I'll sort of spare the the um, just the overview because I think Keith offers some really good points there. But before I um, you know move forward, are there any points here, Keith, you want to highlight first? So I was super, when, when we shared this conversation or these data points back and forth, I was super interested in the fact you had call detail records and cell tower data in this list of considerations. Tell me why. So we have found that sometimes the, the, the CDRs, call detail records, are used more of a QC, okay? So to match up, to make sure that the text messages from the devices match um, match the, the call detail records themselves. So I was in New York. And that was a really cool story that one of the um, audience members had shared during one of my presentations about leveraging the CDRs um, because they had to make sure it was a government agency requesting the data that all that everything matched up completely. So AT&T, whoever it was, was matching what was pulled out off of the devices as well. Yeah, and, and there so was the rub, right? Because as I, I think when we first talked about this, at, at the high level, I've made you the bad guy and said, well, Rick, your phone shows 10 calls, but your CDR data shows 100 calls. Where's the other 90? <laughs> you know, when we can make that kind of comparison inside the data set and then tag those as important stuff and send them for review, that becomes super cool. So I was just, I didn't, that didn't strike me as the normal consideration when I think of a cloud nine or a litigation or a legal issue versus a criminal one most times, right? So yeah. that's cool that that's being used and it just happens to dovetail into our technology partnership too. So great. <laughs> Exactly right. And and cell tower data was has been for those very rare cases, whether it's uh, uh, like white collar, uh, but typically criminal in nature where you need to see where somebody was. Keith has some really cool things to show in a little bit, but we have seen that come into play every now and then. Um, and even just geolocation generally, we it was just one data point. It was a picture taken of a pile of money and in a parking lot in Vegas. And, um and the where was important for that that picture, and that was uh, that was presented too. So um, the data is there. We're creating it all the time, um, and so it just is a matter of honing in. Now we're not advocating, hey, collect everything all the time for every case. It is a matter of uh, prioritizing what data is important to help tell the story for uh, for your case or for your client. Rick, I would also say, you know, we we had to come down on me and my bad experience because, and you mentioned a little bit, but look, we'll just go get that later. We'll get what we need right now and get the other later. And all of a sudden the later is not there anymore. Like, yeah. oh, oh, so, you know, in a safety first mentality, collect it all, store it somewhere, but be selective about what you analyze or what you tag for review and things like that. And, you know, the swallowing that hard pill many, many years ago of, man, I just don't have the time or the storage or the resources to collect everything anymore. And this is from a, a digital forensic world and hard drives back in the day, but you almost have to target, you almost have to anymore with the resources and time and storage available. It's like, well, you got to keep that for seven years in case it goes to appeal. It's like, Oh my gosh, I don't have a server farm in my establishment or to do that. I'm not Google or, you know, whatever analogy you want to bring, but it's, it's tough like that because of the later not being there or the custodian's gone or whatever it is. So I was really, happy that you and I came to that data point of, well, maybe we do collect it all and just be very selective about what we put into the process. So good things there. I also want to ask you about third-party stuff and what your experience is with IoT, because I've attended some fantastic presentations that include, I mean, on one end of the spectrum, an Alexa, you know, mm -hmm. that's involved in, a, in like a murder investigation because of the things that recorded going on in the house to other things where, you know, it's almost trace information. The fact that your baseline human data says you're not up at two o'clock in the morning at night. You're usually asleep. Yet on this day, 
your health data shows this, this, and this. And the fact that you walked far enough away from your phone with your Fitbit that it disconnected from Bluetooth, I mean, all these things that you can put in a timeline then and say, it's like your, your geolocation example in Vegas. Yeah, not only were they there, but prior to that, they were here, here, went over there, were there on that camera, got to this, where it's crazy the timeline you can put together with all of the data sources on the previous slide and the collections of where, where again, where can I get more? How, how finite can I make that timeline where it's just indefensible? You know, you can't get out, you can't get out of that. There's too much in that timeline. So sorry, no. I, I see those bolts and they just excite me from a, a data perspective. Yeah, no, I, I work in civil mostly, so I haven't had to get like that granular, but I've attended the techno conferences and others where I see it. And I'm like, wow, if I ever got into that side of the world, it, it's, it's basically if you're out there trying to think of maybe if you're thinking about doing a crime, just don't do it. It's all going to be it's, <laughs> live it's off so, the grid, right? Yeah, now, I would say, yeah, during civil where we typically see this is a lot of times like the access of those data sources, right? So you, you're, you know, someone utilizing those to perform some type of activity or things like that because they mm -hmm. want to understand like what kind of connections and activities were made around those devices more so than like where is someone specifically located or yep, yep. You know, what, what was it it's what you know what entry what value were they looking for within some of those data sources yeah and maybe the application if you are in civil is the data is all out there um mm -hmm. it is just a matter of prioritizing and, and making the right arguments to to get um to request that data uh from opposing if, if that's what you're doing Okay, well, let's uh, let's do a quick points recap. Uh, what we're going to be covering here going forward is some collection and culling strategies, right? So we talked about targeted collections or collect everything and cull it. Uh, so we'll talk a, a lot more about that and some some real practical ways to do it, use utilizing technology, uh, data processing, automation. So there are, as I mentioned earlier, our system you just point to data and we pull it in. We're not converting things ahead of time. This will make a lot more sense in a little bit. Uh, and then also conversation context. We do it every day, probably, but that is Keith and I might start a conversation over email, switch over to Teams, then pick up our phones, start using WhatsApp because we're going to be super sneaky. <laughs> and then uh, maybe it ends in a 30 minute phone call. That context is really important. And, and instead of having to uh, stop your review, run a search to pull it up, it's better when it's all right there in front of you. And then native review, this is sort of a way back machine workflows. When you look at Clearwell, how Clearwell was used for email back, <laughs> back in the late 2000s. And, and it really revolutionized how we looked at email uh, and, and culled all of that data down. Well, we're doing the same thing on the modern data side with short message. Uh, Brian will talk a lot about that. And then most importantly is is the getting data out, right? So we talked about how easy it is to get data in with automation, but also getting data out is also important, right? We can make all the pretty pictures in the middle, um, but productions we're finding is a bit all over the map. They're asking for things in various ways. And so being a software company, we accommodate those production formats, whether they're images of just individual messages and, and emails, or they're 24 hour thread conversations, or they're redacted, not redacted, all sorts of things, it's it's important to make sure that you have a, a platform that can can help manage that. So those are things that we'll cover here uh, throughout. But before we get into that, I do want to talk about how, uh, without showing an EDRM uh, model, Oxygen and Cloud9, we come together. Oxygen Forensics does all of the wonderful, great collections you'll see here shortly. And then we pick, and they have created a button, just a Cloud9 button that pushes the data out into a, a ready load file and that we're, uh, and we pull all that data in. So we hoover it up like a vacuum cleaner and then present it in ways that um, make a lot more sense. Uh, but in case you have not heard of Oxygen Forensics, Keith will give you an overview and then I'll give, Brian and I'll give an overview of Cloud9. So I think you said I could take three slides for this. I just made one busy slide to cover all the topics at <laughs> once. So. Listen, I started Oxygen in, in 2019, and it was one technology called uh, Oxygen Forensic Detective. And now we do things like remote and collaborate with analytic web technology. And, and the portfolio that does what's in that mission statement, make the world a safer place, has grown and grown and adapted and pivoted. And, and the vision uh, revolutionized some of the things we're doing. And you can see in that vision, we try to empower people. Uh, which by proxy is their organizations and businesses 
to have, a, a, I'll just summarize, like I said earlier, have a better day with their technology, be more efficient, uh, be more strategic. And especially when we talk about what we're trying to do here, collection, get the right stuff, get all the stuff, get as much as you can do it uh, to get back to the, the mission right at the top, make the world a safer place by innovating and bringing our technology to bear. Historically, you know, it's 24 years or so we've been around in the industry and the market. Um, so we're very success oriented for our customers. You know, we have a really great reputation when it comes to education and support. We try to leverage the pedigree of our employees because they bring a lot of that to the table. So I think that's a super strong point for us that we can, you know, if we can share that mentality with our partners, you guys, and the way we do things. I think, Brian, I was going to slip you $20 in your introduction or you said, hey, the great teams are working with at Oxygen. Appreciate that. Same thing here. It's been great working with you guys like that. Uh, so that just adds to that overall pedigree to get us back to our making the world a better place, safer place. So that's kind of what Auction does with a, a good portfolio of technology. And now we're partnering up to leverage it for everybody. Great. Yeah. And it was really fun working with the team at Ilta last week uh, at the booth. So <laughs> I had a really, really good time. Great team. Excellent. Uh, so so Cloud9, as a quick overview, and Brian has been with Cloud9 for, for quite a while, um, is we are... We've been in the industry for over 20 years. Uh, a few, quite a few years ago, uh, Cloud9 Law. So Cloud9 bought Cordington Law from LexisNexis and have can then continue to start developing into those platforms. Um, so one of the the major things that we everyone was concerned in the industry is well, mm-hmm. is it going to let you know is it is it going to get developed into? And yes, that is something we continue to work on uh, for both Concordance and Law. And then Cloud9 Review, very sophisticated, been around for, um, I think, almost two decades now. And that is a platform that is very robust and mature to handle all of the data for the review side of it. It is cloud-based, whereas Concordance and Law uh, are on-prem, with Law also being in the cloud where you can do the processing. So everything that you see or you hear Brian talk about uh, is... Um, actually leveraging law to do the data processing in that automated process there. Did I miss anything, Brian? No, I mean, that's that's right. I mean, really what we've, you know, what we strive to do is we provide both on-prem and cloud-based or SaaS-based applications so that you can deploy in the, in the way that fits your models and, you know, provide you, you know, innovative technology that support all these different data sources. Yeah. And Cloud9 Review, uh, just sort of digging into this a little bit further is this is that DIY. You can manage all of this yourself, but because we are in the modern data world, we know that this that is brand new to a lot of folks. So we have a full services department that are in support of all of our platforms, project management, case management, you know, all, all, all that's needed there. And so we manage the modern data as talked about earlier in productions. And we've also created a, um, very flexible way to start doing business with us and make it uh, cre- create those low barriers there. And then yeah. lastly, uh, we've ran, um, because we've been doing this for so long, and also recently with uh, Legal Week, uh, we were their um, uh, best emerging technology non-AI award winner. So everything that you're seeing today is is um, is that. Plus, uh, we have been doing well with um, G2 and, and others too. So, but Aside from all that, let's get it. Let's get into the weeds here, and uh, I'll turn this over to you, Keith, and you'll just tell me when to hit the button, and we'll we'll keep going. You can hit the button. I did not know there was a non AI uh, qualifier to that award. That's that's a that's a state of affairs. I just don't even like it. <laughs> that has to be non AI. Uh, there's more to it because really we don't have eDiscovery AI just yet. We're getting it's at the cusp, but I don't know why they. they I get really it. upset when I try to do a search on the internet and I get an AI answer, a GPT answer, and like that. I, no, just. Anyway, so listen, this is the overview slide that we had talked about uh, on the broadest stroke, I think, is we're bringing collections to this table of partnership, whether it's workstations, cloud data, device data. I mean, we do a ton of that and get it into our platform. And then we'll talk about some of the calling, maybe first, second, third pass, whatever it is to refine how we get that data out to you guys. From cloud nine perspective. So that's a, a big overview picture that turned really blue, but that tells a short story. Go ahead, Greg. So when I put these together based on our conversations, I just went back to your slide, right? When collection considerations come up um, from device and tablet, especially your targeted bullet, look, collection by far is the stickiest wicket in this conversation. You know, collecting phone data, if depending on the the phone type, the brand, the operating system, the security patch, the application versions, I mean, that stuff changes constantly. 
this is a moving target. Like, you know, there's no other moving target. Um, so we're always, always, always adapting to that, but we have capabilities local or remote in this regard to collect phone, tablet, target the data that we collect, collect it all, just like we said, to get it into whether we store it somewhere and, and selectively analyze it. But as a first collection consideration, we provide a lot in the partnership that way from remote, remote and local collection from devices. Go ahead. So click, go ahead. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, workstation world, you know, laptop wise, I just put a, a screenshot up there of some endpoints. Matter of fact, that endpoints a, a workstation and two mobile devices. Um, but the same thing, there's some super powerful profile creation. And, you know, when we follow up in some other, uh, some other conversations, we can dive deeper into, hey, listen, give me, this is where we can get into the, the filtering. Give me files that are from this date between uh, this size and, you know, this type by, based on content or extension, um, file-based rules, applications, you know, and I sticking with your, oh, there's Teams and Slack only collecting from that entire profile of whatever's on the machine. Let's just go for those since we're team and Slack oriented today. Or system artifacts, which go to file system things and you start talking about egress and ingress things, Brian, like, oh, wow, hooking up, hooking up USB devices to this machine that weren't supposed to be, or, you know, who knows, uh, maybe things going on in memory. We're not necessarily playing instant response, but or remediating anything, but we can see things that were happening on the box at the time, you know, and maybe that helps, helps tell some of the story combined with some of the other filters uh, for collection from workstations. And, you know, that's Windows, Mac, and Linux. And then I think just to make sure we're covering all three, you know, major flavors of a workstation like that. Go ahead, Rick. Cloud and social media, which I guess you can kind of lump those together because most of the social media is cloud. Uh, look, and, and frankly, as time over, over time, data that would usually reside locally on a device, it's all cloud now. So it can transcend all devices everywhere. We have a massively industry leading cool cloud collection technology in the cloud extractor. I mean, there's over hundred platforms here and it's really interesting if you just look at the, the top row of those little icons and you see those little green flags up in the top left, those are updates. I mean, we're again, moving targets. These are constantly changing the, the login methodologies and APIs. So we're always updating this to stay current with the Joneses, so to speak. But when it comes to consideration for this data and you almost have to consider this maybe at the top of everything else because the cloud feeds all the devices and, and workstations at this point. I mean, this is huge. So if this, from a partnership perspective, this is going to be, I think, one of the bigger aspects of collection that can help. Go ahead to the next slide then. And again, I was you know uh, happy to see this, but we have an actual technology that ingests call data records and helps normalize them into you know associated this number talk to that number and or geolocation tower location to put those on a map you know maybe those aren't uh, as the kind of as the crow flies when you see a tower there and a tower there but you can certainly get an idea where somebody was hey that phone was using that tower that made that call i've never been there well your phone has <laughs> you know i don't know if it was you but your device certainly has that's up to you to say whether or not that was you at that point but we have the ability to ingest that in addition to, like I said, taking those records and comparing them against device data to make sure those numbers match, like you were saying before. So it's a great analogy and a great uh, collection consideration. We can also parlay into the conversation. Go ahead. So, you know, in your key points, I, I this probably uh, becomes a little more transparent in the second bullet, but the top two are kind of where we can, we can talk and apply. And the collection and calling, look, Android, iOS, workstations, targeting local or remote and when it's remote it's secure so all those methodologies of collection come into play um, in a processing world you know i make an arrow from the normalization bullet over to uh, just a picture of what i call the kitchen sink because as we talked rick you know some of the value proposition uh, when people are talking to other people about this is again all the different sources from where the data we might be interested to come from and i have no problem looking at that whole list and going wow okay I might not be able to get this from that today, but I might tomorrow. You know, who knows what's going to be parsable or who knows how an application version is going to change or who knows what a, a Google download is going to include tomorrow versus what it did yesterday or what can we get from yeah. this moment tomorrow? This is a, again, moving target is a, is a key phrase here, but that is one case, so to speak. You see the little case folder, the briefcase at the top called the kitchen sink with all of those different sources in there. And what we get out of the sources in the database for normalization that we go search, 
and tag and add notes to or whatever it is, you know, we apply our little key evidence moniker to those things. That becomes the, the sauce when it comes to exporting with that cloud nine button. So the more we can put together like this to refine down to what's important from all those sources, way back to that first slide when we're talking about the different types of data, look, that's great. I, I assume that. I'm all about where can we get it? And I think this is a, a crazy example of merging all those things together. Outlook, computers, cars, clouds, phones, documents. I mean, just crazy like that. So I want to make sure we talked through that one. Go ahead. Now here, I took a whole big screen just to have this conversation. So on the left is collecting everything, right? I don't want to have that pain point of go back later and it's not there to collect because we forgot something. Well, let's only pick things we want to analyze. So we go from everything on the left down to, and again, with your theme of Slack and Teams, just those things. And inside that, and of course, these are a little tinier data sets, like there could be tens and tens of thousands and thousands of whatever those are to go through. But the ability to take an overall massive collection and refine it for analysis is, I think, something that will help in this when we, again, export it to the Cloud9 button. Go ahead. So other ways we can help, it's not necessarily a culling strategy, but this was the example I said, Rick, if you come and say, hey, here's all this data and you run off. I'm like, don't run anywhere. Give me something to go on. You know, whether it's a keyword or some keyword lists, just get us some responsive data out of the gate. My gosh, I mean, if you're all by yourself and you don't have 40 attorneys, or even if you have three and there's 50, 50 tons of work to be done that could be done by 50 people, I mean, you need ways to refine. So searching for sure. And we have a lot of ways we can search. Keyword and keyword list are great. Um, a lot of this can probably be done in context in Cloud9, but if we can help refine what gets to Cloud9 first, like I said, um, this is a way, a culling strategy in my mind to get us a first or second pass. Okay, go on. Um, and this is just a, a kind of a grid view of some of the, the filtering ideology around, look, if we look down the left-hand side, because all of this is in a database, you know, this is Slack. Hey, what account are we talking about here? What groups were involved in conversation? Who are the contacts we we're talking with? And then, hey, can we tag them up? You can see a little column of tags there. Are there attachments to these things? Are they inbound or outbound messages? What are the messages? And then, you know, it's this kind of list we generate. And you can see the column there with the stars are not turned on right now, but those are the, the key evidence things that we would then in turn be exporting. So to be able to filter, I think, is one of the things after collection, and it's a... It's kind of a repetitive conversation, but are you having it talking about computer data? Are you having it talking about device data? Are you haven't talked about cloud data? Are you haven't talked about a PST you've ingested? Or are you putting them all together in the same matter or same folder, again, to normalize them against each other and then filter like crazy? So I consider that filtering, filtering a little bit of a culling strategy, again, to get down to more refined data. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and part of this, too, if you don't mind me jumping in, yes, is um, whether you do this here, whether you do this in the interim step, you'll see uh, Brian talk about or in our platform, it, it doesn't really matter to us. There, there are hosting implications with Cloud9 Review. So uh, our recommendation is to go through, again, tag the people, uh, and that will get their direct and multi-directs, and then tag your channels. That will push out into the load file that will go directly into ours. So however Slack is created, this is, um, it is, I recommend call it. And then you can always iteratively add more data as you go. But loading everything into a, a platform or calling your vendor saying, hey, just load everything in there, it, 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 it could be a little bit overkill there. Well, and that's always the conversation, you know, especially a criminal. Hey, give me everything, prosecutor would say. <laughs> okay, that happens like one time and you back up the truck, you know, oh, don't give me everything. Yeah, yeah, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, do we, how do we make this a smaller? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I added this one and Brian, I, I have to confess, uh, I don't know what will happen when, this does, when we do this. And this is a data set I want to make to give to you and I didn't. Um, but this is something we can follow up on in another conversation. But, you know, offline translation is something we have in our technology. And when you have chat messages that are maybe in need of that, I don't know, does Cloud9 do anything like that? Uh, we do identification and things like that. And we have the ability to do translation as a kind of a services workflow. But we can also intake it. So um, anytime you do something, you know, translated the text, you can bring it in and we search across, you know, basically any supported Unicode language. 
I can't wait. To, not that I don't believe you, but I can't wait to see that because that I have that data set. I just did not get it to you in time to have a straight answer on that. But we certainly do it, and it's something maybe we can leverage as part of a, some data processing. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Rick. And and real quick, ideally mm-hmm. on this, you would translate everything first ahead of time. So if you have access to this platform, or as you have access, like do that first, um, because again, review platforms we're rendering what you're giving us, and if right. you need us to do extra manipulation to that data, there will be additional costs. So this is a really good way to get that uh, that service done. Cost. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know that part. Uh, so, and we also talked about media and, you know, when we were talking through this the other day and I got excited, it's like, oh, okay. So from a video perspective, being able to break out frames, you know, oh, that particular one is super important. Let's make that key evidence because I don't have time to put the, or there's a, it's a 45 minute video and there are three frames that are the key here and i want those right not to mention if we have you know the kitchen sink going and we have all those different data sources and we show duplicates across them you know maybe that construction site picture was sent to 10 people who claim they don't have knowledge yeah well okay i can't speak for your brain but i can speak for your device having access to that data you know so some of that we can do as we clump things together and start marking up our key evidence again that might be media-based versus context conversation based so maybe that's effective in the in the data share Go ahead. So, yeah, in the end with that, you know, whether it's a computer, uh, a straight up email. And, and one of the things I want to mention it here, just because it's not a strictly normalized data source that you would think, oh, it's a phone, it's a computer. Uh, we have the ability to ingest native loose files. So if somebody says, oh, well, I just found this whole folder full of whatever it is. Hey, take that folder and bring it into detective and add it as another data source in that case, in that kitchen sink. Um, so I could put that up there at the top as well. And, you know, we can make our own exports and things, but the important part of our conversation here is, okay, let's do a load file export. Let's only include those things we marked as key evidence from whatever filtering or whatever searching, whatever, whatever we did, whatever selective analysis we decided to, to pull off and then do our magic button on the right. Right. And that's right now that button just translates into give it to Brian, um, even though it says cloud nine. So that essentially is where, we collect everything, go through some crazy uh, ideas of calling in my mind to get it to this format, to get it to that button, to give it to Brian. And then Brian comes next. Yeah. And, and just one other question before I go over to Brian is, um, so how does, how does this work, right? Are you, uh, are we, is the, the person buying the software, putting it on, on a laptop, going out in the field, talk, talk through some of just the the general nuts and bolts of licensing and what's available, remote collections, it's just any and all of those things. Yeah. So let's, let's take the ORE technology, Remote Explorer, which is local and remote from a device uh, collection perspective and endpoints, you know, workstations, ideally we're, we're trying to mitigate the whole, Hey, take that hard drive out and send it to me. <laughs> you know, let me fly across the country to sit down at that computer and do what I need. And we can deploy technology to those endpoints and collect from them on a schedule, you know, on a targeted basis, whatever it is, through a console. So that's how that works. Those are those endpoints are licensed in that technology. So if you have, you know, 10,000 endpoints out there, we'll get them in the databases registered and you can collect from them anytime you want at that point. Same thing with device, phones. When I say devices, uh, that's on phones or tablets. So those endpoints can also serve as remote device collection endpoints where you, Rick, I could say, hey, Rick. You know, we've established this relationship. You know that machine we have there, that that static environment box sitting there? Oh, you need some phones done? Okay, go hook those up for me. I'll collect them here and we can provide them out for review and analysis like that. So it just depends on what we're trying to collect. Cloud. Cloud is simply a uh, button inside the, the interface that you click and it starts the cloud extractor technology and we feed it credentials. Now, therein lies a whole different facet of the conversation from a collection. I mean, to get into cloud data, to get into those accounts, we will need credentials. Where might we get those? As you think in your head, hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. typically workstations and devices, you know, because, hey, we're human, Rick, I'll bet you $10 you've used the same password more than once this month. And if you, if I lose $10, I'm going to be really shocked because part of the practice that we don't even talking about here, because we're talking about, you know, load file and data review, but Part of the things we do when we import a workstation or a device is go gather stored password information and credential information, which, you know, and we, when we do a little deeper dive later on, we can look at some of those things where we can pass those directly to the cloud extractor to go access those accounts online, you know? So generally, um, 
<laughs> there's requirements to do that. That's not something everybody just does without somebody authorizing that somewhere in some type of fashion, but the technology is certainly there and it requires both facets, the way to get in and the ability to pull it down and, and analyze it. Perfect, thank you. Sure. All right, Brian, so this is, so now you saw the button for cloud nine. Now here we are. Yeah, excellent. Well, you know, thank you, Keith, because I think that kind of covers a lot of kind of the process around the collection workflows. I will mention what you guys are going to see today is us dealing with what we've been talking a little bit about in that Slack and Teams, you know, format. But just know we do uh, support, you know, the processing and support of, you know, really kind of any data sources that you may have, whether that's email, Word documents, Excel, some of those other data sources like we talked about, geolocation, some of the computer activities, <laughs> things like that. So just know what we focus on today is not our only, you know, only scope. A couple other things that I'll kind of highlight, you know, that, that Keith mentioned is what you're actually ingesting into Cloud9 Review can be a single targeted source. So Keith could go in there and apply some filters, identify some relevant custodians, run some search terms, and then you get into review and you realize, wow, Rick was important, Brian was important. There may have been some additional search terms that you're dealing with. One of the things that I'll highlight about the workflow we have with Oxygen here is we actually uh, allow you to hash records and deduplicate on a message or level, or, you know, uh, item level. So if you do go back and say, hey, you know what, I do need to do that recollection because you did that original collection and it was targeted, but now you have the same data just twice. You don't have to worry about figuring out what you've already promoted and then, you know, pulling that out and then only promoting what's different because we actually will deduplicate any of that content that has already been stored with inside a Cloud9 review. And it makes that process really easy. That's that's one of the nice things that's kind of seamless within this workflow uh, on the Oxygen workflow. Or of course, if we have other data sources like email or something that's going directly and we do that on those data sources as well. But speaking specifically around just the Oxygen workflow here, uh, what we're pointing to is just a exported version of the Oxygen data source that uh, Keith showed you how we do. Once we select that, we can load all that content as new records, and if you want to continue for me. Um, from there, what you'll see is on the left-hand side is all of the available fields that were exported from the Oxygen workflow, and then on the right-hand side is all of the Cloud9 review fields that we can point to. What's nice about this is we have an auto mapping process built for Oxygen. So if you click on the next screen there, Rick, you don't have to go manually go, hey, in Oxygen, it's called, you know, uh, the participants and here it's called from or something like that on the Cloud9 review side. We actually built this specifically for uh, Keith and his team's uh, profile, and we provide that to clients as needed uh, so that they don't have to remap all that content themselves. Once you hit the open, you know, that uh, file, it does the auto mapping for you. However, if you have some of the tags that are not yet generated in Cloud9 Review, you can also create builds and things like that during the import process. If there's content that may not yet exist, like the work product you added in Oxygen, or maybe there's a specific unique data source that has a unique property that Oxygen collected, and you're like, hey, I don't have that available yet in Review, you can add those fields. From there, it's pretty simple. You'll basically get a, if you hit the next button for me, Rick, you'll get a little summary screen of what you're about to push up. In cases where text is only embedded in the body or the basically the field of data sources, we even generate text files for you so that you can produce just like you would for email with actual text files uh, as a lot of discovery protocols request. We also generate near native versions of messages so that you actually have a document for each message in case you want to produce that content with Bates numbers and labeling and all that kind of stuff that you do in your e-discovery workflows. Once you click the start, you know, upload process, it's going to run in the back end and you'll get an email notifications, all that kind of fun stuff. But what you end up with is basically what you're seeing in front of you. This is an example of an individual message with inside Cloud9 Review. And what's nice about this workflow is you can actually put this content in chronological order. So if I send a message to Rick saying, hey, Rick, please don't tell anybody about this. And two seconds later, he texts Keith. Guess what? I can actually go in the order of context and see those messages and see how that content is related. We also embed attachments and videos, photos, and other objects within the viewer. So you have the ability to access those uh, pictures and videos and view them. But from a defensibility standpoint, because we know, you know with e-discovery, attachments need to be standalone records as well. We do generate a record per attachment so that you can produce that defensively as well to meet all of the protocols and requirements for e-discovery productions as well. The other thing that we do is we generate a dynamic, uh, and this is just navigating between messages, for example, where they wanted to see the, the photo of the dog and have a little FaceTime with them. 
But what you can see is we also have the ability to generate 24 hour threads. And this is dynamically built. So we'll only display the messages that are currently available within the system. So if you do do an additional collection and more data is missing, we collect Rick's phone and he's missing some messages. We collect Brian's and he's got those messages. It's not a static document. We actually generate this dynamic view so that you are able to see all of the custodian's data sources together. And this can be, you know, really important. I mean, Rick, in the initial conversation we had, mentioned the custodian that we had to go collect 100 devices to rebuild his conversation. This allows you to do that. What you also have the ability to do, though, is actually individually tag messages that may be relevant or irrelevant. And for example, I've tagged a few of these messages as privilege. And one of the things that happens in you know, text messages and Slack communication is you have a lot of different topics. Sometimes it's irrelevant, sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's privilege, and a lot of other applications force you to draw redaction boxes. What we do is we actually empower you to withhold that content based off the tagging that you applied. And so for example, you'll see I've selected on the right-hand side to exclude all privilege records and I actually put a withholding uh, text. And so if you go to the next message there, Rick, you'll see we actually withheld that first message. We can still see all the photos, but we're giving you defensibility on that process because we still track control ID numbers. We still can generate priv logs, withheld logs, and other formats. So we try to bring a lot of the defensibility to the actual process so that you're able to keep that data in that you know, forensic format while still leveraging it in a reviewable fashion to navigate, to tag, to organize, to search, so that you're not you know, only looking at just PDFs or screenshots of a text message conversation and now having to you know, figure out how that information is connected. Okay, so uh, we're just about done here. Uh, I do have one question I see. Um, that is, just confirming, this also has email and loose files, and all of this lives together in one platform. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we have a lot of you know cases, especially in the civil world, where it's an email followed by a Slack message. I'm sure everybody on this call has probably gotten that email, and they're like, I am not responding to that email until I talk to someone else. And how do you do that today? You just send them a message and say, hey, did you see that email? Do you know anything? Can you tell me what you know? You know, you go back and forth. You're like, I don't know, but let's bring in someone else. And then you create that other conversation. We let you actually kind of timeline that process so you can see the email followed by the text message, followed by a few Slack messages, back to the email, back to the Slack channel, instead of having to, you know, open up a bunch of different documents, do a lot of finger pointing to say, okay, we're in here in the timeline of this conversation and we're here. Okay. This was sent. Oh yeah. This way you just can basically put it in that view so you can chronologically sort that information. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So as we take this down to the runway, uh, I do want to mention we have uh, actually put together a pretty extensive white paper that maps out the process from uh, beginning collection, um, even information governance considerations around modern data. And so it's a very um, extensive white paper you can find at uh, cloud9.com. And so we know that being uh, this still new to a lot of folks, we are in education mode. Uh, we are all here. Um, and you'll see here uh, our information, um, reach out to any of us. We're, we're here as an open source to, to help navigate and guide you through these, uh, these challenges. Um, but one thing that we're finding is that the, the data collection, getting data in, the review and export is becoming a lot easier uh, for all data, traditional and modern. And so if you have, uh, again, any questions or need to chat with any of us, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, there will be a recording. We will get that out to all of that have attended. And um, I don't see any other questions. So thank you all for attending. And this is first of a three series uh, where we're going to take deeper dives into collections and review workflows uh, over the next coming months. So look out for those emails. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on one of these webinars. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much. Fantastic day.